Hello, I'm Kevin Jones and I live in Calgary, Alberta. And I have a confession to make. I'm an audiophile. So welcome to my short video on building a high-end audio system. I'm doing this to share some of my experiences over the past 40 years. I've noticed there are lots of magazines and videos on the virtues of various components and what some people view as the best. I'm not going to get into that. So whether you're new to this hobby or been around longer than myself, I hope you'll find these useful in making your own decisions. First of all, here's what I'll be looking at. Uh, some history of audio, how my perspectives have evolved, what's the value of high-end audio to yourself, some considerations I've made in evolving my system and components, and where I'm going from here. So, starting with a bit of history here, Back in the 60s when I started, there wasn't really much in the way of advertising audio. The television advertising focused on cars, toilet bowl cleaners, and cosmetics, and come to think of it, uh, much like today. If you wanted a stereo, you visited a few local stores and picked what was most attractively packaged, mostly from Japan, or had the most switches on the front. If it was a real audio store, they may have had a wall of different speakers that could be switched on and off with different receivers or amplifiers. In hindsight, this was a terrible way to pick a system. This method didn't tell you anything except what could sound louder. So for many years, I listened to tunes, and I won't even call it music at this time, on my Sony integrated amplifier, tuner, dual turntable, and Dynaco speakers, all connected with a lamp cord and cheap aluminum interconnects. Basically, I didn't know any better. It wasn't until the introduction of the CD player in the 80s that I decided I needed to get up to date. After all, the CD player had perfect sound forever, so they all had to sound the same, right? Okay, so I fell for the marketing and bought a player. They weren't that expensive. Actually, I have the CD player to thank for making me realize I was indeed an audiophile. I couldn't stand listening to it. It just sounded wrong to me. Despite the ticks and pops from my crappy turntable, it at least played music. So I took the player back to the store and told the salesperson how disappointed I was. He said I must have good ears. Nobody else ever had comments like mine. I changed it for a more expensive one that wasn't so irritating to listen to. It in fact had a lot of, it lacked a lot of the features of the cheaper one. I think this was my first clue that something was going on that I didn't understand. So I started to do some research on my experience. It was frustrating. All I heard was how weird I was since nobody else thought like me. I finally stumbled upon a magazine, and I'll give it a name here, UHF, and it was from Canada, no less, that didn't make me feel like an idiot because I thought CD players sounded lousy. At that time, even, they didn't know exactly why they sounded that way. Like a lot of new technology, it would take years to get it right. So I'm going to cover off some high-end audio basics for now. So continuing my research, I'm an electrical engineer, by the way, I came to some conclusions. First of all, the source is king. If the source can't deliver the detail, no other component down the line can put it back in or fix it. Also, there's a big difference in the quality of the initial recordings as well. Simple is better. The more wires and switches in the single signal path only serve to degrade the music. And I'll describe a little experiment I did shortly. Big speakers don't mean better music. A small rigidly built speaker that controls the residence, resonances of the box will sound much better than a big box that doesn't. Quality connectors and cables are components in themselves and the room plays an important role in selecting and setting up your system. So what did I do with all this newfound knowledge? I went out and bought a used Lin LP12. The music it played was a revolution. I had never heard 
uh, the music that was in my vinyl collection until then. So my first two lessons learned, the importance of the source, and if you can't obviously hear the difference an upgrade makes, then why would you buy it? So I was really hooked. Okay, a little experiment I did with my now replaced Sony integrated amplifier. I did it because it really wasn't worth trying to sell. The first thing I noticed when I opened the cover was the massive wires going everywhere. The connectors on the back weren't even gold flash, they were aluminum. I didn't have a circuit diagram to follow, so I had to try and trace the wires myself. And I figured it must have taken hours of labor to put this thing together at the factory. So how much could I remove and still have the system operate? Well, most of it has turned out. I stripped all the switches out of the preamp circuit, so all I had left was the volume control and figured out where I could go in directly to the amplifier. There much, wasn't much to the amplifier itself. I could see the majority of the cost of the whole unit was in the labor it took to put together and all the junk switches and wire it contained. Did it sound any better when I had stripped it to the basics? Only marginally, but I did learn my third lesson, simple is better. Okay, before I go on, I want to talk a bit about value and what it means to you with respect to high-end audio. Value of high-end audio is a very personal perspective. We all have different financial means and the enjoyment we expect to get from that investment. What may seem outrageously expensive to one person may seem like a bargain to another. High-end audio doesn't have to cost a fortune. If you select and buy with care, you can get many years of enjoyment out of your purchase. Upgrading is generally costly, but this can be offset if you sell your quality used equipment in good condition. You can also look at used equipment from places like Canuck Audio Mart, uh, where you'll get a big discount off the original selling price. As my system evolved, let me talk about, first of all, the sources. And uh, firstly, the turntable. Are they really coming back in vogue? I already mentioned I bought a used Lin LP12 with no arm and a line-driven motor. There are certainly no shortage of high-end turntables at various price points in the marketplace, and I'm not going to try and do a big comparison between them all. Suffice to say, the Lin has worked exceptionally well for me. I went through a number of upgrades to it, namely an Itog arm, Hala power supply, Circus chassis, and a Benz micro glider moving coil cartridge. Every upgrade let me hear more of the music. I'm done with the upgrades uh, to it. I don't see any uh, point in going further with it. I think the benefits uh, uh, are not what I'll, I will get uh, for the cost it's going to be to me to go through further upgrades. And that's my personal opinion. So let's have a... An one is the tuner. And uh, I bought a f the Fanfare FT1 tuner because its performance on live broadcasts was so exceptional. But radio has changed. There aren't many live broadcasts anymore, and most radio stations broadcast over the Internet as well. I think we'll, this will evolve with more high-definition content coming online, so I question whether the purchase of a great tuner these days is, is really worthwhile. However, I've really enjoyed this. I went through a number of CD players over the years, but my last one was a Lin Akima. It was an excellent player. I've used it for many years and was able to sell it at a good price. I'm moving to a computer-based system as my music player. I replaced my ancient Sony integrated uh, firstly with a Bryston amp preamp combination. And no question, this was an upgrade. And I got a good return on my original investment with the Brysons when I sold them. But I started looking at some other things as well. First of all, I remember one of my original lessons, simple is better. 
I had read about a passive preamp someplace and it tweaked my curiosity. After all, you can't get any simpler than that. So as an experiment, I went to the basement and found some old volume pot and uh, some RCA connectors, all crappy parts. When I put it in place of the Bryson preamp, uh, in most ways the sound was really appalling, but it did do one thing which blew the Bryston away and surprised me. The sound stage and focus were amazing. So with this, I, I went out and bought some uh, high quality part connectors, a small box and, and put it together with some silver wire. After all, good preamps are expensive. They have to deal with small signals and handle them very carefully without screwing them up. My passive unit amazed me. If you don't need a long cable run between your amp and preamp, granted a limitation the passive unit has, I encourage you to build a unit like this as an alternative to an active preamp. It will save you a lot of money and provide great performance. You can buy manufactured ones as well if you don't want to build it yourself. The phono preamp. Okay, I continued to use the Bryston preamp only as a phono preamp. I finally replaced it with an audio mat, and that's a, a French maker from for a phono stages, and again, a major improvement over the Bryston. And uh, the small Bryston preamp was, uh, or amplifier was eventually replaced by a, a Sim Audio W3. Again, a huge improvement. Uh, I've left the discussion on speakers to last because most people think of the speakers as the most important part of the system. They couldn't be more wrong. I like small speakers uh, when they can be built with a box that's very uh, rigid uh, and stable. The image and depth can be much better than a floor standing speaker and cheaper as well. I had bought uh, one of the original pairs of the TOTA Model 1's when they came out and I've used them for over 20 years. Every time I made a component change it came through obviously on the totems. So for over 20 years of listening and that that's a to me is a bargain. When I did move to a larger listening room uh, I did add the totem Stor storm subwoofer. The cables. Uh, there's probably no more controversial item than cables. Some are horrendously expensive, but one thing I do know, a cheap $5 interconnect cable that you get with um, any big box uh, item that you buy are crap. You need to buy good quality cables with good connectors, and buying used uh, can be a good way to go as well. I did replace the spade connectors on my speaker cables with uh, the WBT Next Gens, and that made a big difference to the performance. And the way I looked at it, although they were relatively expensive, I got a better speaker, ca speaker cable for a fraction of the price. I'm going to talk uh, just briefly about home theater, and, and I've heard some fabulous multi channel home theater set setups over the years. Uh, big bucks and big rooms. So really, the question in my mind is, multi-channel better than stereo? Well, I remember watching uh, The X-Files years ago. And uh, when I heard the soundtrack, I had to jump when I first heard the, the introduction. On my stereo system, the sound was moving right around the room. And remember, this is with two channels. In my opinion, it's much better to quiet buy a quality stereo system than a poor surround sound system. So overall, I haven't gone through a lot of swapping of components over the past 25 years. I've also had a lot of use of most of my components and got at least uh, some of my money back when they've been retired. I'm moving uh, more to a computer-based uh, digital system in the future, and I'm still trying to figure out all the ins and outs of this. There's a lot of information, and I haven't uh, figured it all out yet. So perhaps I'll do some more videos on this in the future. 
Thank you for listening, and I hope I've provided some useful guidance in your quest for better music.